Thank you, Jules. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks to Jules for being the techie behind the scenes. I have the easy job of just welcoming everyone here this evening, especially our members and any new guests joining us for the first time. I'm really particularly pleased this evening um, that we have the speaker for our next talk, so just something else to put in your diary. On the 29th of June, uh, Gian Pentieri is going to be talking about the gardens of Westminster Abbey, and I'm really delighted that you've joined us again uh, this evening, Jan. Um, so perhaps you would put any quest questions to uh, Victor for the Q&A in the chat, or at the end of the, the talk, you can ask directly uh, to Victor, perhaps uh, Jules will do some monitoring and, and help there. And of course, Jules will be putting everyone um, on mute uh, to ensure a better uh, sound for Victor. Uh, Victor's going to be talking for about 45 minutes. Um, and many of you will know uh, that Victor is an author and a London historian. He is a prolific treater and he's an active member of our Thorny Island Committee. And I must say that Victor was game enough to take up the challenge to create this talk, especially for, this, uh, for us this evening, and when prompted by our treasurer, Robert. So we're really pleased that both of you are here actually this evening. Anyway, I'm delighted, Victor, that you, you know, you've done your usual scholarly research for us this evening. And the Royal Aquarium is really an elusive subject um, if it, anyone can elucidate it, it's you, Victor. So over to you. Thank you very much, Sue, and welcome to everyone, Thorny Island members uh, and guests. Well, this uh, picture you see before you is of the old, rather romanticised uh, Thorny Island when the Tyburn came down and joined the Thames and formed a, a, a barrier around the, around the, the old village. Uh, it never really looked like that, but it's still, most of the buildings that you see there are still here today. West, I hope you can see the cursor, Westminster Abbey, Westminster Hall, the Jewel Tower there, all still there. And of course, the Tyburn still runs down here, down Great College Street, now mixed with sewage, unfortunately, to the Thames, or at least to an interceptor uh, pipe that takes it downstream. Uh, for, our, for our purposes now, I'm, I'm starting off with this because this building here, is a good place to start. This is the, the gatehouse of the old uh, of uh, Thorny Island and the and the Abbey. It's long since been demolished, but in its place is the where, where what stands there now is the memorial for pupils, ex-pupils of Westminster School who died in the Crimea War. It's that Crimean memorial. You'll see a big a big column, which we'll see in a moment. So I'm putting it there because we're the building we're talking about, and it's the first time I've ever done a meeting, a, a talk on one building alone. Thank you, Robert. And the, 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 the Crimean memorial is just about the, there. It is there, and the, the building we're talking about is just there. So this is very, very close. So let's... um. Let's move on. Now that's the, the aquarium as it was when it's in full splendor. People have varying views about it. It's a, I think it's well a nice building, a handsome building. If you, if you um, cut off the towers at the top, it looks a bit more ordinary, but still pretty good. But with those two, two, those two pillars there, I think they can't, they're not um, load supporting or anything. I don't think they have any function, but they just make it rather nice. And this bit here, we'll learn of it about later. First of all, let's do a bit of a, a timeline to set this in context. So we're talking here about other buildings that were uh, in Westminster there at the same time, and the history of the aquarium, and you can't do that without its relationship with all the other pleasure gardens which existed in London, and which London led the world in a way. And it starts off in 1729 when Vauxhall Gardens opens, that was a, a big, bigger uh, garden. Just uh, you can still go down to Vauxhall Station, come out of the southern end, and you'll see the entrance to the, the gardens as they were. There's nothing that remains, but the actual ground is still there. Uh, and that was made famous by um, Samuel Pepys, who went there a lot, and Hogarth, who were very closely involved with it. So that started it all off. Then there's a quite a big ju jump to when Ranelagh Gardens uh, started up, uh, and that was at uh, the, the north of the Thames. It's where the Royal Hospital is now. And if you go into the Royal Hospital, which you can when not, not during the COVID period, uh, then you can, you can go in and go down the end of the road and you'll find Ranelagh Gardens there. 
The Westminster Hospital was the next building that was recently completed. Cremorne Gardens was a, another big pleasure centre which uh, saw off some of the others uh, and it lasted right up till the time when the, when, uh, the Royal Aquarium was in operation. In 1851, the year of the Great Exhibition in Hyde Park, which will form the feature of this talk, Vauxhall Gardens closed, leaving Cremorne dominant. 1860s, the Westminster Palace Hotel, which was the other side of the road uh, uh, to the aquarium in Tothill Street. 1868, Westminster and the St. James's Park stations opened, so that meant lots more people could come to here. Otherwise, you think, why do you put an aquarium there? It's miles from the West End where all the action was, but that was one of the, the reasons. And I also mentioned here the Grand Opera House, which was at the beginning of Whitehall, going from Parliament Square up Whitehall, immediately on your right, about 100 yards up, there was a, a plans to build a grand opera house. And we'll see about that in a moment. Queen Anne's Mansions was at the, the bottom of Tothill Street at the, at the end, uh, the Royal Aquarium uh, length almost to St. James's Park Station, not quite. And just beyond was Queen Anne, Anne's Mansions, which we'll come to, but it was just newly built. M meanwhile, the Alexandra Palace opened, although it was destroyed by fire temporarily. And the Royal Aquarium opened on January the 22nd, 1876. And a year or two after that, Cremorne ends, leaving the Royal Aquarium with all to play for. And there was also a theatre attached to it, which Lily Lankry, Lankry took over with some, with some success. And in 1903, the Royal Aquarium closes and the Imperial Theatre was taken down and moved brick by brick to Camden Town, Canning Town. Okay, another look at the at the aquarium and seeing the, 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 that ceiling, that roof, which goes right the way along there. We'll see see more of that in a minute. Uh, and this is, is Tothill Street was down here. Tothill Street is a very narrow street, so there's a bit of artistic license here. It would never, I don't think, look like that. But you get a pretty good impression of the building. A bit more context. No need to read this, it's all blurred, but it, it's a mere fact that it was a, when they opened the aquarium, they invited various people to try and prove its credentials. It was to be an upmarket intellectual cultural event. And so they invited the Scientific American, which came and gave a little, a little review of it. It was opened by the Duke of Edinburgh, the then Duke of Edinburgh, son of, um, of Queen Victoria. And the, the, the idea was to continue the flavour of the 1851 exhibition. And here it is, he observes, the extensive aquarium, which is the main object of this institution, cannot fail, if properly directed, to stimulate the love of natural history and the acquirement of scientific knowledge. The access to a useful reading room, the daily performance of good music by well-chosen orchestras, the periodical exhibition of such collections of paintings as we see around us, these are agencies which cannot but exercise a most beneficial influence in refining and cultivating the public taste. The Duke of Edinburgh then declared the building to be open. So you can see with the, the, the huge ambitions it had to actually uh, ha have something that the, the, the Cremorne Gardens and the uh, and Vauxhall Gardens didn't have, something that uh, was really culturally upmarket there. Uh, this was the, uh, the the people who applied, the, the, the builders of the aquarium applying for a license had to give some reason. The bench knew that almost every town of importance now had an aquarium. That's Brighton, Great Yarmouth and Manchester. And this society had resolved that the metropolis should be no longer an exception. It had been found by experience that the visitors to other aquariums liked to have other amusements as well as observing the fish. The directors had therefore determined to have a botanical display and there would be a summer and winter garden. For this purpose, arrangements have been made to procure a large supply of exotics and when completed, there would be a beautiful conservatory stored with exotics for a winter promenade. The old reproach of foreigners against the English people that they did not appreciate music was no longer applicable and we are now a musical people to gratify this growing taste on the part of the public, the directors were organizing at great expense a large band of skillful and able musicians. And Mr. Arthur Sullivan of Gilbert and Sullivan, the eminent composer was to have the direction of all the musical arrangements. An art gallery was being formed and in this too, the directors had been assisted with the advice and suggestions of many distinguished artists that included Millet, 
So it all looks good. But there were objections. First, Westminster Abbey. Mr. Slay for the Dean and Chapter earnestly depreciated the granting of these licenses. He could not feel that there was more in this question than was apparent at first sight. Of course, he fully acquitted the directors of any ulterior design, but he was impressed to say that what might happen if the institution should by chance fall into other hands. In that event, there would be a great, again, a lot capital loss. That was the, the um, let's move that over slightly. That was the objection from the Dean and Chapter. Westminster School authorities said that this was quite simply and entirely a commercial endeavor disguised under professions of a desire to cultivate an artistic taste among the people. Its first object once over would be the production of a good dividend and being so the bench as men of the world would easily be likely to see what would happen. So that was their, their objection. St. Thomas's Hospital next door also objected to the obvious noise, but th then Mr. Strait, who was uh, on, on behalf of the builders, so it called in Mr. Stone, a uh, lecturer on experimental physics at St. Thomas's Hospital, who said that he had made a special study of acoustics and had been requested to conduct the experiment, which was made by means of the Coldstream band. Of this experiment, he gave some further details and said that both as a hospital doctor and student of acoustics, he was convinced there could be no possible annoyance or disturbance to the hospital patients. And so it turned out the patients couldn't hear the noise of the, of the orchestra, nor could they hear the workmen working in the surroundings. So they obviously had some good uh, acoustics themselves. Right, let's go switch to today. Now, as I mentioned, that, that's the, the memorial to to um, ex-pupils of Westminster School who died in the Crimea War. That was there then, and it's there now. Here you can see the edge of the buildings by George Gilbert Scott, which go on to Westminster Abbey. You come out of Westminster Abbey, it's West Entrance on the left, they're, they're all there. Today, the office buildings with the Barclays Bank there. You've got the, 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 the central hall, which replaced the aquarium. And in the back is the Ministry of Justice. We'll come back to that as well very shortly. Here we are. There's the memorial. There are the, the, the buildings uh, by Gilbert Scott. West, we're really looking at it from Westminster Abbey Gates. There's Victoria Street. This, uh, before the Barclays Bank and offices took over, was the Westminster Palace Hotel. It was a uh, well over 400 people could be there. It was the most modern, had the first to have hydraulic lifts. And for a while it housed the India office. So India was actually ruled from this building. Uh, maybe that's the reason why um, Gandhi, who was visiting here, started a correspondence with Tolstoy. In the background where we saw the Ministry of Justice is this building, Queen Anne's Mansions. You, some of you may remember from a previous talk about this, but it was built 17 stories high, nearly twice as high as any other building in London, without planning permission. The fire brigade said they could not have ladders, they haven't got ladders to reach to at the top if there's a fire. And there was a question, should it be pulled down? Well, it wasn't pulled down, but as a result of that, a few years later, legislation was changed that you could not build large buildings anymore. I believe that legislation is no longer in application, especially not round Victoria Street. And on the right is the is the Royal Aquarium. You see it's got Zulima, the strongest woman in the world. She was the star filling then. She isn't actually going to form much of this talk because we have several other women whose first names begin with Z who are actually perhaps a bit more interesting, even more interesting. So that's um, as it looked then. Even bef before that, the, the memorial's still there. Be before they built the aquarium, that's what it looked like. 
And the reason for, one of the reasons for building it down Tothill Street, the whole length of Tothill, almost the whole length of Tothill Street, was that it was regarded as a wasteland. All the buildings in Tothill Street were a wasteland. You don't get that impression looking at these. They look rather like not uh, like built like uh, shops you might like to have in Victoria Street now. But anyway, at the time they were they were th it thought to be the front to a to a wasteland. And here you can see that there's, there were some uh, built, there's still some buildings immediately next door to it. Okay, well, the, in the, um, uh, you can see the Royal Aquarium in Tothill Street underneath. Underneath Tothill Street is, of course, Victoria Street. And then to the right of the Royal Aquarium, you can see Westminster Hospital, barely 30 feet away from the Royal Aquarium. You can understand the noise. Stationary office behind. Thomas's Hospital. It's Westminster Hospital. Westminster. Did I say Thomas's? Westminster Hospital. Uh, and uh, the Guildhall behind it. And to the right, in going up to Whitehall, there's the, the, the National Opera, which we'll come to in a moment. Okay, next slide. Robert? Yes. Okay, this is um, Queen Anne's Mansion, which I mentioned, which is where the, the Ministry of Justice is now. And you just see how outrageously high it was at that time. And it's also rather ugly. And that, that caused a, a, a tremendous amount of controversy at the time. The St. James's Park Station is just down there to the to the left. Okay, next slide. That is another picture of of um, Westminster Hospital, and you can see how uh, how much space there was in front of it, which there isn't isn't now. Next. Now we come to the one which you couldn't get before, which is the plan of the building. Uh, at the bottom, going running right along the bottom, this is going down Tothill Street. You see, they're all tanks full of water in order that they hope to have fish. And, and uh, up on the uh, round the corner, up on the, right, the top right of the building, also that. In the main uh, atrium, you can see either side there are places where there'll be exotic plants. There's a place for an orchestra, uh, which could take 48 people and hundreds including singers and everything else that that was a again one of the reasons they wanted to uplift the whole concept of it in the top left there's a reading room again that's for intellectual refreshment and um, bottom left is the is the theater which was a uh, not I don't think you can walk into it from the main aquarium it's definitely part of the whole construction uh, before it was um, pulled down and moved elsewhere okay next slide Now, it's an aquarium, okay? Although, quotes, the largest salt water tank in the world remained unoccupied, visitors could inspect white bait, starfish, conger eels, crustaceans, clams, oysters. I'm not sure people would have gone to the Grand Aquarium to see this, but they, when it opened, they had no fish. They, they just hadn't uh, been able to finish everything in time and it never actually fulfilled its potential in terms of being a, a serious um, aquarium. Next please. Except uh, it got to this stage, a piscatorial exhibition. The maritime and piscatorial exhibition of the Royal Aquarium was opened yesterday. It is to continue for a month. The exhibition contains a collection of stuffed fish or casts of fish contributed by no fewer than 15 people. Well, there are, I don't think you go to a grand aquarium to see stuffed fish, but there we are. Next slide. This is Westminster Hospital. Again, it's worth looking at this just to see what it looks like in front. On the right hand side, you can see the railings of Westminster Abbey near to the Western entrance. And look how different it is. it was then to, to now. A really lovely open space. Next slide. Now, this is the, the Grand Opera House, which is, it, it is interesting because it's been built in roughly the same time as all these other buildings. And it was built, if you can imagine going from Parliament Square up Whitehall, then just go 150, 100 yards or so, and on your right is where, it, is where this building was built, going right to the embankment. We're looking at it from the embankment side here. Uh, when, I, when I came across this a few years ago, I thought, wow, wouldn't it have been lovely if they'd actually got it underway? But clearly this is only an engraving and it wasn't built. Or was it? Later on, I saw a letter that had uh, complaining about it, saying that, that uh, it had been abandoned after five million bricks had been built. Now, I don't know how high you'd get with five million bricks, but I think it's pretty high. And so I, I guess that it would have come reached almost the top to the roof level 
when it ran out of money and the government wouldn't give it any, wouldn't bail it out. That's the treasury building just behind the dome. Uh, you can see just to the left of the dome, they wouldn't give it extra money. And so it, um, it uh, had to be demolished. So only after a while, people were complaining about the eyesores of it. And so eventually it was, um, it was pulled down, except that the basement still was still there because it was so solid uh, and is used to, used today. And one uh, person, uh, the, the son of the impresario who'd built it, wrote to the newspaper saying how sad it was that that, that um, rooms which had been built for opera stars were now occupied by criminals because it was under uh, Old Scotland Yard. Okay, next. Right, last evening, the latest addition was made to the Theatre of London by opening the Royal, Aqua Royal Aquarium Theatre. Without actually communicating with the Royal Aquarium, the theatre forms part of the same handsome building with the architect, Mr. Bedborough. Okay, next question, next one, let's have a look. There, there it is, it's, not a, it's quite a, a good looking building. Uh, and this, again, it's the end of to uh, Tothill Street um, and it's seen in red brick and uh, it looks rather glammy. This was it on a on a, a sunny day, as you can see from the sky at the top. Can we move to the next slide? This is what it looked like on a wet Wednesday. Not quite the same thing, um, but nevertheless, it um, it was there, and there was a theatre in Westminster. Next slide. Someone said this of the of the building of the exterior of the building. This is the Royal Aquarium, architecturally considered. If we decline to say much, it is on the ground that much cannot be said. Damning it with faint praise. Next slide. So this is what it looks like again. Uh, again, I think it looks. I think it look, everyone has its own opinion. I think it looks rather rather handsome, but um, it had mixed views at the same at that time. Okay, next slide. This now this is inside as it was being built. Uh, and uh, you saw at the top of it, at the top of the of, of the of the roof of the building there. And it's all built with with uh, glass squares or oblongs of glass, the same size with uh, uh, iron, which are again uh, built in in units. So it's clearly uh, directly inspired by the Great Exhibition in Hyde Park. Um, and low they they brick they put stone round it, Portland stone. Uh, that that's what it looked like from inside. You you can see. Uh, Westminster Abbey at the background um, but that gives you some indication why they could build it fairly quickly I think it's about nine months it took to build uh, that doesn't happen today uh, but that's to the inside okay next slide now this is the inside of the Royal Aquarium and again I think it's, a, it's an impressive building and all that glass and the, the light that's shining into it you've got the the uh, the aquaria either side you've got galleries going either side uh, higher up you've got statues you've got a fountain at the back uh, and of course the ice skating rink at the back bottom the reading room chess everything lots of things but it was got done on a pretty grand scale okay and I think uh, walking into that it must be a pretty impressive sight it's said to have been cold and not surprising I suppose especially when it was the winter garden rather than the summer garden but it's um I think uh, it's um rather good Next slide. That's the ice skating. Everyone had to have an ice skating rink and uh, the Royal Aquarium was no exception, even though there was another one just by uh, just behind Queen Anne's mansions by, by St. James's Park Station. There's another ice skating rink there, which actually held the Olympic um, uh, competition for ice skating in the, at the turn of the, of the 19th century, the 20th century. Okay, next one. This is the interior of the Great Exhibition uh, in Hyde Park. In a funny way, it doesn't give you quite such a startling impression as the other one does, uh, as the Grand Aquarium did. But there you can see the, 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 the tiers of galleries on either side. Uh, there are statues, there are all sorts. This is much bigger though, it doesn't look like, like this because it went on for so long. It's much bigger than the, than the Royal Aquarium. And you see in the middle a tree and uh, that was rather inspired. The tree was in, already in Hyde Park and rather than pull it down, they built the, the Grand Exhibition all around it. Next slide. And this is the, the Great Exhibition. It's worth pondering on this because not only was it the direct inspiration for the, the, the Grand Aquarium, but also for lots of other buildings. Uh, 
it was built um, to to house the, the great exhibition in Hyde Park. You can still go to Hyde Park and see the premises of it. The, the ground is still there as it was. Uh, and um, it was built in a very short period of time. I think it was seven or eight months. It, um, it was built at the time when the railways were being built also. So people from all over the country came to it. Uh, and uh, it was the first time that, that the upper and lower classes, if I may use those terms, actually mixed together. And there were worries that there might be riots if this happened. Uh, in the first week or two, they they, they, they uh, had much higher prices and so poorer people weren't able to go. But after that, uh, they, they came and the equivalent of a quarter of the population of Britain visited this exhibition. Uh, Norman Foster was asked quite recently in an interview, what was the his iconic building? And he didn't say any of the, the ones that we see around today. He said, oh, without question, the 1851 exhibition, because uh, it, it set the tone for so many other buildings. It was uh, built in, 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 in similar units for iron and the, and the glass, the glass, the glass um, windows. Uh, and it had a, an effect for many years after. If you go into the the British Museum now, which was built by Norman Foster, look up and you see that the, the, the atrium roof, roof is could have is obviously uh, inspired by the by the Crystal Palace. Now the Crystal Palace was uh, uh, only uh, destined to be up for whatever it was eight months or so because it was in the Royal Parks. That was the deal. It made a huge amount of money, enough to finance the Albert Hall, the, the Science Museum and the Natural History Museum and have money left over to invest. And that money is still being profitable and been, is distributed to worthy cause, to good causes. Uh, and it was, the Great Exhibition was really the pinnacle of Britain's industrial power. Previous uh, exhibitions, like for instance, in you had one in Paris, it was just French products. You come and you buy our products. This one was brave bravado Britain, asking anyone in the world to bring their products and match them up with against Brit Britain. Of course, this was the height of the Industrial Revolution and we were producing a lot, a lot of um, amazing goods. But that's it, that uh, is worth dwelling on that because it does um, affect so many other things. You see on the, on, on the top right, that's just the, the inter inside of it, which I mentioned before. Okay, next question, next slide. This is one, another one clearly inspired by the by the the exhibition, not quite the same shape, but the same sort of iron and, and, and glass um, formation. Now, this was the one that was built for a similar industrial exhibition in Dublin, okay? But just as the Crystal Palace in Hyde Park was dismantled and reassembled in Sydenham, in the place now called Crystal Palace, and rebuilt, so the the Dublin exhibition was taken down and, re and reconstructed here. Now, unless you know already, you might be quite surprised where it is. The bottom half is Battersea Park with the, with the pond and the shrubs. And behind is the exhibition. In between is what we today call Prince of Wales Drive, a, a road I've uh, tra traversed for decades without having any idea that at one stage, uh, the whole of one, more or less the whole of one side before the mansion blocks were built, was uh, something that uh, another re the replica exhibition of the of 1851. So that's uh, as we're going slow progress to the to the Royal Aquarium. Can I have the next slide, please, Robert? Thanks. Uh, now this uh, wasn't the only one being being built. This was the People's Palace in the East End, in Mile End Road. And this was a, a crystal palace for, for, for ordinary people, for working people. Whereas the, the, the great exhibition of 1851 managed to, to, to blend all classes, uh, just about the only one till then that had done that. Uh, this was one just done for, for working people. And the next slide will show hopefully that, that that's that's Alexandra Palace again in North London again built primarily uh, for poorer working people but of course anyone can could go to it and again you can see uh, the modified inspiration of the of the 1851 exhibition next slide thank you now we go back to the beginning now uh, Vauxhall Gardens which opened in when it was 1789 uh, eight, uh, 1729 and this is only a black and white thing, but you get, you get an idea of the size of it. And again, you can actually go to Vauxhall Station, go up the southern side, and you can go into the 
into this area. None of it exists today, but the, the, the land, the grass is still there uh, and, uh, as it was, uh, in the same area as it was. So that was Vauxhall which started it all off. Uh, and as I mentioned, it was uh, Samuel Pepys that was, was familiarly there. And it was used a lot for courting purposes, unquote, as much as anything else. Next one. Right, I'm now introducing Leopold Mozart, the father of Wolfgang, who performed at, uh, at the Ranelau, which were uh, gardens we'll come to in immediately. But I just came across a few weeks ago, a friend of mine just sent me, it's, it's doing some research, that Leopold Mozart uh, sent a letter to a friend of his in, in Austria. So it's private, never meant it for publication. And just, I thought it was, it was uh, next, next one, please. It was, uh, I was trying to move it myself then. And he said, Vauxhall was amazing and it is impossible to describe. It put me in mind of the Elysian fields. Imagine an exceptionally large garden with all manner of tree-lined avenues, all of which are lit as if in broad daylight by many thousands of lamps, each of them enclosed within the most beautiful glass. In the middle is a kind of tall open summer house in which can be heard an organ and an orchestra with trumpets and timpani and every other instrument. On every side and in every corner there are tables laid for supper. Well that gives you some idea of the of the scale and the uh, and the and the and the, qu the quality of the Vauxhall Gardens. Next slide please. There it is again, slightly blurred, but that shows you, it gives you an example of what he saw and what was he amazingly impressed with. And of course, there weren't similar ones in other countries. They they followed it. They, 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 there are lots of imitations of the garden, the pleasure gardens of London, but um, uh, not at this stage. It was quite unique. Next slide. This is the Renlau Gardens, which uh, came just a little bit later. And uh, as I say here, if you were looking for pleasure in late 18th century London, there was only one place to go, Ranelow Gardens. It was the Tinder and Spotify of its day, providing dating opportunities with seductive music. Edward Gibbon, author of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, described it as, quotes, the most convenient place for courtships of every kind, the best market we have in England, close quotes. So, that was the Ranelagh Gardens, uh, which is, uh, uh, again, the ground is still there, as we may see from the next slide, if I remember correctly. For the next slide, thanks. There, there it is, uh, with a, a statue of a pensioner there. If you go into the Royal Hospital from the Royal Hospital Road, uh, which has a public entrance, it doesn't look like it, but it's open to the public. You just go to the end of the road and you'll see uh, Ranelagh Gardens, Gardens it's still, they're still called Ranelagh Gardens, and uh, although there's no relic of the original Pleasure Gardens, it's there and it's a very quiet place to, to relax. Okay, next one please. Right, this is what a typical afternoon would look like. We're going into the, into the aquarium now, having seen the background. Um, now, there's, look at all that on just on one afternoon. It's um, the monster baboons seem to be the main ones down at, down at the bottom. Uh, and there's Zara, the one or two that we're going to see a little later. But uh, that's just one afternoon. And the next slide shows the whole day. Can we have the next slide? Thanks. So it's difficult to read this, but um, the, uh, the, the, the people organizing it all had to do these every day, every week, had to have the, these amazing, uh, uh, this amazing uh, menu of, of acts from all over the, all over the world. And we'll see one or two of them in a moment. Okay, next slide. This is Joseph Conrad lived nearby in Pimlico for quite some time. And you, some of you may have seen the plaque in Gillingham Street. And his, uh, his book about him mentions that Conrad used to frequent the Royal Aquarium in Westminster in the evenings, a venue which had left behind its aquatic beginnings and was famous for circus and music acts. George Roby was to make his reputation is her debut here in 1891 and it's a likely place for romantic or mercenary encounters between men and women you can see the way the aquarium was going the aquarium in westminster and the royal standard opposite were far from the lodgings in pimlico where conrad started to write almeo's folly okay the next and this is a uh, not directly concerned with the the aquarium but it's where one of these star performers Zazel went afterwards and I must mention it because it says here from the Aquarium London Zazel has performed over a thousand times consecutively and has been applauded by nearly two million persons 
day performance on Statia, which Zazel will appear. Who was Zazel? She's the first lady beginning with Z. Next, next one, please. So there she is, Zazel. Oops, being shot out of a cannon. Don't look too closely at this because you might wonder, A, why she's so confidently looking back and with her arms outstretched and uh, why there isn't a net behind her so she doesn't fall in, into the audience. Again, a bit of an artistic license here, but this was a big, when, when the, 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 the fish never really took off and the high-minded ideals of the aquarium soon faded. And in order to, to, to fill that immense space, they had to go down and down market. And this was the in-between in one, which uh, uh, and there she is shot from a cannon. Can we have the next slide, please? And we'll, there, there again, she's shot from the cannon and she's looking behind as she's shot out. So it's, uh, uh, it's a bit difficult to take, but she it was there, she did do it. And then I think it's the next slide, if we could have that now, Robert, that shows a correspondence made by Mr. Robertson, the manager of the aquarium on the subject of this performer, who generated a lot of controversy, said to be a girl of 17 or 18. It seems that on April the 21st, Colonel Henderson wrote to the manager by direction of the Home Secretary who'd been complaining, quote, to give you notice that if the performance of Zazel is continued, it will be my duty to communicate with the licensing justices and also that in the event of any accident occurring, whatever legal responsibility attaches will be strictly enforced. In reply, Mr. Robertson of the Aquarium states that he is perfectly prepared to accept any legal responsibility in connection with the performance and quotes will be happy to show Mr. Secretary Cross or yourself at any time the mechanical contrivance of the cannon and demonstrate practically not only the entire absence of danger but even the novel and pleasurable sensation of being fired into the air if either of you will honour him by being puffed into space. So he's saying to, to, to the Home Secretary and others, come and be Zazel. Uh, the objections faded after that. Next slide, please. Right, this is to the varied entertainment in the Great Hall who has been added since the engagement of the young performer known in public as, as Zao. It's another Z, Z-A-E-O. The carrier part of her performance does not differ in claim from others which have become familiar with to the frequenters of the Royal Aquarium. She crosses the Great Hall walking on and so it goes on. So, But she turned out to be even more controversial than Zazel, as we'll find from the next slide. So there she is on a, she, on a, on a rope, which is one of her specialities. Don't look too closely at it because you wonder how she she stays on it because uh, both another none of her arms are touching the rope and it's rather uh, loosely fitted around her around her leg, but if you see below there are three three men, uh, one is pretending he's got his hands in front of him, another one's got his hands on his eye but his eye is definitely looking up, and the, the gentleman on the left his eyes are practically popping out of his head looking at Zeo. Uh, notice that they are all gentlemen uh, that whenever they uh, the avid advertisements of this kind they they tried to to emphasize the upper nature of the of the aquarium so that that uh, was zeo who proved very controversial again next slide please and this is the the, the picture of her that was really controversial although today it might not uh, in, a, in a bathing costume like that and, and i think her leggings going right the way down might not seem very uh, controversial, but it was in those days, and so that's what uh, what this was a poster that was put out, uh, and uh, that caused all the objections. Next slide, please. See, see her triumphant cries of indecent from the Society for the Repression of Immorality greeted posters advertising the performance of Zeo, acrobat, gymnast, and aerialist at the aquarium in 1890. The posters were withdrawn but she remained an attraction for over a year. In 1903, the aquarium was sold, etc., etc. So that was Zeo. Next slide, please. Now, this is Zeo still. Throughout his campaign, Captain Moseworld man maintained an attitude of strained credulity, puzzled that the British public should have reacted so violently to his harmless publicity on behalf of Zeo, angry that they should have imputed to the aquarium an institution 
universally renowned for its respectability and refinement, actions which outraged public decency. He published an account of the affair entitled Oni Swagi Malipense, in which he gave the life of history as heir. He was, curiously enough, the orphan child of an Anglican clergyman. Next slide, please. The, again, the licensing committee in renewing the Westminster Aquarium license did well to enter a protest against a certain class of exhibitions which have come to be associated with the aquarium. The disgust of the committee was starred by the exhibition of Zouar, another lady being the Z, who was advertised to hang by the neck for six days. Hang from the neck, but fortunately I haven't got any pictures of, of her, but you can see the extent to which the Aquarium was going down, well, this will be the, the 1890s, uh, deteriorating rapidly. Next slide, please, Robert. Ah, this is, um, the, I'll read it out in case you can't. The noble vision of the Royal Aquarium was to encourage, quote, public instruction and entertainment, unquote. But standards soon deteriorated in an attempt to arrest the fall in customer numbers. The founding rule that quotes no lady unaccompanied by a gentleman would be admitted after dusk unquote lapsed into the admit admittance of lots of women whose prime interest was fishing rather than aquariums one such lady emily turner was lucky she was picked up there by a notorious serial killer thomas neil cream masquer masquerading as major hamilton he offered to see her to set her up with rooms in lambeth he gave her pills which made her ill, but happily she survived. However, she refused to identify cream in court for fear her lifestyle would become public. There he, does. he looks like a serial killer. Next slide, please. There were some fish in the, in the aquarium. They brought a, a whale over from North America and uh, it was petted and fed right till it got to the aquarium, but within a couple of days it was dead. So the biggest attraction at the Royal Aquarium was a dead whale. Next slide, please. Here is Captain Cosententus. Uh, people queued up to see a man tattooed all over with tattoos absolutely everywhere. I guess that if the same thing was done today, the audience would be tattooed and the person up front would be unusual having no tattoos but in those days this was highly unusual next please now samson the strongest man on earth daily look at his muscles bursting chains and he demonstrated his powers by by li lifting up weights and doing all sorts of things and dumbbells and everything else uh, and he succeeded in this until one day he, in, he gave his usual uh, challenge to the audience. Does anybody want to come up and try and beat him as the strongest man in the world? Well, one young person from Germany, one young man from Germany did come and he lifted something above his head that Samson couldn't. Oh dear. It's not known whether the on future posters said Samson the second strongest man on earth, but there he was one of the, the, the stars of the show, a bit devalued. Next slide, please. And there was also Zulima. You remember we saw her advertised as the main attraction at the, on the front, on the outside of the aquarium. And so Zulima, the, the female Samson, does some almost incredible feats in the way of lifting weights and breaking iron bars. So we don't know much, at least I wasn't able to find much more about her, but that is a, another Z. Next slide. Now, we turned away from Z to Miss Lala. She came from Paris. Uh, this is her painted by Degas, the Impressionist. It's a pretty beautiful picture. Uh, it's, a, it's painted uh, against the background of the actual place she was performing. She's hold, holding on by her teeth only. But look at the way she's poised in the air. It looks really uh, neat. When you pick, compare that with the 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 uh, lady uh, in the aquarium uh, who was barely hanging on to a rope, uh, then this was uh, uh, amazing. Anyway, she came over from Paris to the Royal Aquarium. Next slide, please. 
and she did. She was La Femme Canon. You saw her hanging on by her teeth from a rope, but this was her piece de resistance. She was holding up a cannon barrel that's, that's actually being fired from her teeth. There's La Femme Canon. I don't know if you can see all that, but uh, she seems to be also holding things in her outstretched arms, but she's on a trapeze upside down with a, a cannon. Okay, next slide. This is her as one of the numerous acts, and you can see on the, on the bottom right uh, that she's that uh, she's shown not holding anything in her arms, but actually holding up a cannon barrel. How much we can believe of that can only be guessed at, but there, there she was. Next slide. Then, then they descended into a, a, a kind of freak show. Even un, more unusual were the freaks e exhibited at the aquarium, all presented as being of special interest to students of medicine and natural histories. A scientific approach. There was the two-headed nightingale, described as a dusky lady with two heads, four legs, four arms, and two bodies which ran into one, who also managed to sing tolerably well. On another occasion, a 13-year-old three-legged Spanish boy we needn't go on. You can see that how the, the aquarium and its desperate bid to attract people had to go down and down market. Next slide. This um, the exhibition was continued for a month. The exhibition contains a collection of stuffed finish, fish or casts of fish. Goodness me. Okay, next slide. This um, one of the ladies we are supposed to have done something similar to this, but this is Tommy Burns. I think he's a professor, uh, Tommy Burns, and he dived from the almost the top of the aquarium into a, this very small pool, uh, six foot deep by all accounts. And uh, you can notice the audience again, all very well turned out. The, the, you wouldn't think there were any other than richer people there. Next one. Again, all sorts of acts. This one was a, a snake charmer from Abyssinia. Next one. A, a, a gorilla called the Pongo, the only living specimen of the, of the gorilla or man-like ape that has yet been exhibited in Europe. Again, it's, a, it's allegedly of scientific interest, but uh, there it was in the aquarium. Next one. And look at the, uh, yesterday, the 27th of the daily stages of Suchi's 40 days fast at the Royal Aquarium was completed. So again, another example of going, going down market. Next one. This is um, nothing to do with the aquarium as such, but it was a it was a man who walked from Dundee to the London Aquarium, pulling a wheelbarrow. He came down here, and then went back. So that was a as as, a, as, an, as good an achievement as uh, most of the exhibits at the aquarium. Okay, next. Now as we're coming towards the end. The closing of the Royal Aqua Aquarium. Were people sobbing tears? Last night, the prevailing note at the aquarium, no longer to be numbered among the popular resorts, was one of hilarity. It was generally recognised that the directorate could not refuse the offer made for the site and premises, and that therefore it was no good crying over suspended entertainments. There was quite a holiday crowd alike. In, alike in numbers and high spirits. For the final time, the patrons came to enjoy themselves, and there is every reason to believe they did so. Next one. Now, no need to go into this, but this is the, the auction. Uh, everything was auctioned off, including a 60,000 gallon iron water tank, which doesn't seem to have been used a lot for, for fish. A lot of the tanks were, were drained and used for other purposes when uh, the, the aquarium side of it didn't, uh, didn't work out. On view two days prior to sale and catalogues may be attained, blah, blah. Okay, next one. Now, when it was known that the, that, uh, this was happening. 
and uh, the, the it was brought by the Methodists and inquiries made yesterday with regard to the mass meeting of the Methodists to be held in the aquarium tomorrow evening showed that so great had been the desire of Methodists to be present at the meeting for the purposes of celebrating the acquisition of the aquarium that the further issues of tickets had already been stopped and the organizers of the meeting have been compelled to reject the most pressing applications from all parts of the country when you think how that the 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 new Methodist Hall could uh, could accommodate thousands of people. That, that there's an amazing popularity. Next slide, thanks. Now this was um, uh, the statement by the Methodists to um, I can't pull it down uh, on the on the opening of it, and it says that the, the Methodist. Uh, it's fitting that the Methodist Church representing the largest Protestant community in English-speaking countries should decide to put on that site a church house and central hall which will be the centre of the religious and educational and the philanthropic work of Methodism. They hope before very long to erect there a building which in its beauty, its simplicity, its utility and its permanence would be typical of the great church to which most of those present belonged. Since Wesley opened his famous chapel in City Road, no more important step has been taken by British Methodism than that of securing that site and erecting upon it the great central hall. They were not going to become political dissenters, for Methodism as such had no politics. Cheers from the crowd. But they were not indifferent to the great questions which affected the interests of mankind. If they had to fight over again the battle of freedom for British people, black or white or yellow in any part of the world, he trusted that the voice of Methodism, British Methodism, would always be attuned to the voice of the founder. Lot cheers. That sounds absolutely amazing, but let's lead, read the next sentence. They must look also to the Wesleyan Church as the great rampart against the arch enemy of civil progress and religious freedom, the Roman Catholic Church. More cheers. So that is a, a bit uh, of a, a contrast to the, the aims of Methodism. And of course, the, the, the Central Hall was built not far away from Westminster Cathedral, which was the great, the, the great centre of, um, of Catholicism. Next slide, please. OK, won't read this in detail, but this is when it was built. I think that meeting may not have been actually inside. Uh, and uh, th this is interesting because it goes into the accounts and uh, how much it costs, which I have um, reduced as the, f the end of this talk. I think we're just about on time uh, in the next slide. So the cost of the aquarium to the Methodists was £342,000. but 275,000 was recouped when it was sold as the surplus land they didn't need. So the actual cost was 67,000 pounds. And the market value of the land of the main building that remained was 250,000 pounds. So the, the uh, Methodists had done something which the, the aquarium had failed to do. It made a profit out of, out of this. And that is really the end of the story. And in, in short, it's that the, the aquarium made the fatal mistake of trying to appeal to all classes of society and satisfying none. And what a shame that that building was pulled down and isn't there doing something else now. Thank you. And for any, I'm very sorry about the, the uh, interruption in the middle of that. Uh, we don't know quite how, how that happened, but fortunately Robert had, had, had uh, set up this backup, which I hope was okay. Mm. Thank you, Robert. No, thank you, Victor. That was really tremendous. I mean, super stories and um, amazing uh, written stories. And I thought you began really well. You were talking about cultivating the public taste, and I thought that's definitely Thorny Island. And then we went on to intellectual refreshment. I thought, yes, that's us too. And then it, you know, um, dead whales and stuffed fish. So um, <laughs> a broad spectrum. Uh, but uh, let's open it up to questions if Jules would like to handle them in person or from the chat. Thank you again, Victor. Thank you. Okay. Um, Russell commented when you were talking about the bricks of the Opera House, 
he said, um, just to, to, for comparison, the Bankside power station, which we all know as the Tate Modern, used 4.2 million bricks. And the, goodness, and that's bigger than than the, the the opera house. The opera house was, did I say five million bricks? I think you did. Yeah, yeah. Think, I'm still looking into the background to the the uh, the, the opera house because it's uh, it's fascinating. I mean, um, if only that had been uh, still there now, it would transform things. But that's very interesting. That because that is a much bigger brick building. Yeah. For that. Um and um. There was obviously an entrance fee, I suppose. You know, they sold tickets for the to the aquarium. Was it um, funded in any other way, or um, just through ticket sales? No, I think it was just through ticket sales. I've forgotten exactly. A shilling comes to mind, but I suppose it's probably quite right because a shilling was a lot, a lot more in those days than ten p is today. Uh, but no, I, I'm not aware that they, they had that. They, it was a company, and they had shareholders who put in money. Uh, but uh, they they didn't have that. There was no government support or anything like that, anything like that, um, to my knowledge. Okay. <clears throat> and it seemed like the um, the entertainers came from um, all over the place, as did the exhibits. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. And they all had to be paid for. They were coming from all around the world, and they they had to find the the, the money from all that and try and make a a profit for their their shareholders and the at the annual meetings one they did a, do do a bit of some stage but they 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 were they weren't really making any money and that's why it had to eventually eventually sadly close right yeah um stuart uh, um says uh, finance for the methodist central hall um they m must have been able to flog the land at the corner of tot hill and dartmouth street so that was the the bit of the site that they got all that money for yeah that's that that, that would be that would be it because they although it's big the the central hall it, it only occupies a comparatively small part of the of the whole complex yep yep right okay i think that's it on um on questions that i've got unless anybody um no. Uh, could I ask, Victor, uh, I mean, one of our members of the Thorny Island Society um, is Raymond Gubbe, a very famous impresario, especially in relation to the um, Royal Albert Hall. Was there such a figure for the aquarium? You know? The key figure was somebody called Farini, who was both, uh, he was the one who was brought in to bring it down market or bring in more money. I don't think he was, he, uh, there's actually a, one person who's identified with a whole lot. There was a board of directors. There was a huge board of directors that were almost guaranteed not to get uh, sensible decisions. But um, no, there wasn't any, any but Farini, uh, he actually devised the, for instance, the, 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 um, the, the cannon that, that, that shot Zazel out. Uh, and he was himself a tightrope walker as well, but he's also um, an entrepreneur. And he, he, I think he also linked up with Barn, Barnum of Barnum and Bailey in America, and some of the, the acts went went there. So he was uh, very much entrepreneurial, but he was uh, associated with more of the the um, down market um, events, and so he's has it has a, a, a say in its rise and its decline. Uh, Victor, I was really interested in in your sources. I mean, and you had so much. So many publications and, and entertainment bills and so on. Uh, whereabouts did you do your research? It's main, It's mainly online. The thing about about if you're if you're doing so, so, just looking through the internet, you're not going to find anything. But once you know what you're looking for, then there's stacks of it there, often hidden in, on the third or fourth pages. Uh, and so, almost uh, well, when I discovered the the discovered the Grand Opera House, that, that, that engraving, I, uh, I thought I'd never heard of that before, but of course, once you, you know that it's there, you can, you can search for it now, uh, but you've got to know that it's, it's there. And, and that uh, comes through. I, I did go, go through quite a lot of the newspapers because now uh, I'm a member of the London Library. And so you can get uh, that your subscription includes uh, newspapers, which is why you had some of those blurred uh, images. But I thought it be best to put those out because they were all coming from uh, original, original sources. Um, and uh, if you press images on, on most of these things, most, a lot of images come up. There's only one book that I know that's been written about the, about the, um, 
aquarium and I actually still got it here from the London Library and uh, he really is a very similar theme about how it uh, it tried to appeal to everyone and in the end appealed to to nobody it had a where are we it's a uh, it had um uh a lot, a lot of very blurred photographs in the in the middle of it, and it was cured, it was produced by the American University of Beirut, and uh, and made available on some an American website. It's a, it, it, well, you'd think it would be a London and English thing, but it, it wasn't. But um, they're, that, they're the kind of uh, the main sort of books, of course. You get, but one, I, I look, look a lot at old books. But they're all now increasingly online. If you and, and if they're online, they've generally got the the engravings and everything on as well. So uh, increasingly, everything is 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 there. There's not much that isn't isn't online. Uh, Victor, if you're very careful, you're going to make an argument against our archives and for members <laughs> who are who are listening um, here this evening with us. I think there is an on going debate between myself and Victor certainly <laughs> he's saying everything's on the internet I say we need books yeah, we do need books we do need oh. books yes. any other questions or comments observations mm -hmm. uh, perhaps if uh, we normally put any questions that come in after a talk um, to Victor, don't we, Jules, and um, put those in an email that we send around with a copy of the of the talk. Because I think there's so much detail, uh, Victor, which is absolutely marvellous. Um, I wonder if people would unmute themselves and just say a, a, a thank you to Victor if there are no more questions. Or if there are any questions, do please throw them. Yep, yeah, and do email them to Jules or myself and we'll link. Oh, Pat, has Pat got something to say? Thank you. Thank you. Victor, I was just going to ask, were the bricks reused, the Central Methodist Hall? Did they reuse the bricks from the Royal Aquarium? No, it was, um, I don't think so. The, the Royal Aquarium was for sto stone out, outside. Um, they, 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 uh, there was talk that, the, that some of the foundations of the of the Royal Aquarium were kept and they're, they're underneath the Methodist Central Hall. I did, I have written to them to ask them about this, but they haven't replied because it's uh, it's COVID, I, I guess. But a lot of buildings uh, did retain the foundation. Our Westminster yes. Cathedral is built That's on the like foundation it. to the old prison that was there. Then the foundations are still there underneath. And so I wouldn't be surprised oh, wow. if parts of the, the Royal Aquarium are still there uh, un underneath, because uh, uh, but I'll, uh, I'll see, but I don't think that that, that any, but the, on the other hand, people, they did reuse, you know, brick, bricks and stone. The, the, lot, all this comes into London, very little of it goes out. It's all reused somewhere. So it's indeed, possible. Indeed. They, they, they might have to, I'll, I'll look more into that. Um, we've just got a, um, Chris Dawes would like to ask a question in the chat. Are you okay, Chris? Ask yes. people to keep quiet while it's happening, that's okay. <laughs> Sorry, someone's got some background noise going on. Um, can I read it out? Perhaps. Yep, okay, I'll read it out. Um, Chris says he is intrigued by your comments, Victor, that there are still surplus funds from the Great Exhibition. Who holds them? HM Treasury? Have they been applied to anything since the Albert Hall and museums? Yes, they they have. Um, they, uh, the last time I looked, I think they made about two million profit. Uh, I don't know any individual uh, what ones they're given to, but it's a it's not it doesn't go to the treasury. I mean, it was a separate company, it's a, a charity that, that was set up, rather like you know <laughs> the original London Bridge. London Bridge, it's the, the, some of the profits in the original London Bridge, which was financed by tolls, that is still doled out uh, each year to worthy causes. So some of these things were were amazingly successful in those days and the the um the 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 the, the, the money from uh the for the great exhibition uh was um invested and as i say is now producing sort of plus or minus two million a year which uh, uh and it, they mainly go to to things that are in keeping with the principles of the of the exhibition which was you know to try and increase science, scientific understanding and, and industry and merge industry with with um, design, uh, any, any any ideas like that? 
Um, Trisha is asking why it was called the Royal. Why was it the Royal Aquarium? Good question. You might say, why was it called Aquarium? Yes, that's true. <laughs> I think it was entirely for the, to give it kudos. But they, they apparently there's a lot of politics behind the Duke of Edinburgh, son of Queen Victoria, going there. A lot of people did not want him to be associated with this, but he was wanted to make a, na a, a bit of a name for himself and a bit of publicity. Uh, and so he, that's that's uh, what he did. But it was a, no, it, it could be done under the Trade Descriptions Act, I think, for <laughs> Royal Aqu Aquarium now. Thank you, Victor. <laughs> okay, so there really are no more, more questions in the chat now. Mm. Okay, well, sorry to have been premature in asking everyone to, uh, uh, to perhaps unmute and, um, and to thank Victor, which was, and to thank Robert also behind the scenes impresario. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Okay, look forward to seeing you uh, very shortly.